The barons demand that your highness confirm the liberties and laws of King Edward with other liberties granted to them and to the kingdom and the Church of England. Why amongst these unjust demands did the barons not ask for my kingdom also? These demands are vain and visionary and unsupported by any plea of reason whatever. I shall never grant such liberties that will render me a slave. April 1215, London, England. The hated King John refuses to guarantee the civil liberties of the English people. The rejected document is to become the Magna Carta, basis of our individual liberties. Live from the Johns Hopkins University, feud over feudalism. Hopkins File 7, presented by the Johns Hopkins University for the ABC Television Network from Westinghouse Station, WJZ-TV in Baltimore. Each week, Johns Hopkins University brings you a special report on how today's scholars and scientists contribute to your daily life and help shape the course of your future, underscoring the fact that all human advancement begins with education. This week, the Johns Hopkins University presents Feud Over Feudalism with our special guests, Dr. Milton S. Eisenhower, president of the Johns Hopkins University, and Dr. Sidney Painter, professor of history at Johns Hopkins. With this, our 458th television program, we inaugurate our 1959-60 broadcast season, our 12th year of network broadcasting. We are honored to have with us today Dr. Milton S. Eisenhower, the president of Johns Hopkins. Dr. Eisenhower. I'm sure that many of you have seen this device before. For some months past, it has been shown at the beginning and end of each of these File 7 programs and has become our signature. It's a replica of a model of the universe constructed in France in 1701. I called attention to its symbolism just a year ago, and I'm pleased to do so again as Johns Hopkins File 7 enters a new broadcast season. At the dawn of the 18th century, as this old model shows, the universe was thought to be a kind of mechanical marvel. The stars, the sun, and the planets were conceived as moving according to orderly, absolute, and unchangeable laws like the, like the parts of a giant clock. As quaint as it may appear to us today, this model commands our respect, for it represent, represents one step in man's constant attempts to understand the mysteries of the cosmos. Now in an age when earthbound frontiers have disappeared and our horizons have extended into outer space, we're still in the process of exploring the mysteries of the universe. We should be a bit humble before this old 18th century device, for it reminds us that our modern theoretical knowledge of the world in space may one day again prove to be hopelessly outdated too. But we must never cease the constant search for knowledge. And thus this replica is a fitting device for our television series in which we follow the creative efforts of scientists and scholars as they strive to push back the walls of ignorance. During the broadcast year ahead, we shall examine with you phases of science, art, medicine, history, and many other fields. We shall consider subjects from the earliest beginnings of man up to the present day, and now and again we will take a sortie into the future. This Johns Hopkins program, I'm proud to say, is the oldest television series on the air. As we go into this 12th season, I extend earnest thanks for making the series possible to the American Broadcasting Company and to the staff of Westinghouse Station, WJZ-TV. And now it's my pleasure to present your host on Johns Hopkins File 7, Lynn Poole. Thank you, Dr. Eisenhower. Did you ever stop and think about the individual freedoms you have? Probably not. 
And I like many things, they aren't missed until they're gone. And there's not much possibility of their going because your individual liberties are guaranteed, guaranteed by this document, the Bill of Rights. Now, embodied here are the freedoms that we all cherish highly and have fought for often. But I really wonder if our understanding of these freedoms is as great as our appreciation of them. You know, the historian maintains that you cannot retain or maintain what you do not understand, and you can only understand the concept of liberty by knowing something of its past. So today, to acquaint us with the origins of our liberty, we have with us a distinguished historian, Dr. Sidney Painter. Individual freedom is an old idea that no government has absolute rights over its people, and down through history, you find many examples of governments trying to strengthen their position by diminishing individual liberties, and the people resisting. Individual or civil liberties, as we know them today, had their start with the Germanic people of Central Europe. Between 400 and 700 AD, the Germanic people spread over the European continent, covering what is now France, Germany, Switzerland, most of Italy, Spain, North Africa, and the Balkans. The Germans had lived by hunting and cattle raising in a very thinly populated land, and therefore needed little official government. Their descendants in the Middle Ages formed into two classes, the free and the unfree. The unfree were little better than slaves. The free were knights and few people have ever been more free than they. The knight was a man of fighting, jousting, and re relaxing, and in none of these recreations was he a model gentleman. He had neither manners nor morals. He was fierce, arrogant, lustful, and completely undisciplined. He was a barbarian in desires and actions, but he was a free spirit who valued his liberty and was ready to fight for it for any reason, real or imagined. The greatest king of this period was Charlemagne, who from 768 to 814 ruled what is now Germany, Austria, France, and Italy. Charlemagne's descendants quarreled fiercely among themselves and consequently were not able to organize, to repel the raids of the Vikings who plundered the western coast, the fierce Magyars who swept into the Rhine Valley from the east, or the Moslems who captured the delta of the Rhone. The empire of Charlemagne disappeared. Any government that had existed also disappeared, and anarchy reigned. Every man who could afford the full military equipment of the day, helmet, leather coat with metal rings sewn on it, sword, shield, lance, and war horse, did as he pleased. He had a squire or two to help him and serfs to work for him. This equipment made any man a knight, but no one could grow rich or powerful under anarchy. Each knight wanted unlimited freedom for himself, but he also wanted other knights to fight for him. The knights therefore made arrangements among themselves which would secure the necessary cooperation in war with the least infringement on individual freedom. We call these arrangements the feudal system. A poor knight with only 60 serfs and a moderate estate would become the vassal of a slightly richer one with, let us say, 200 serfs and a larger estate. This knight in turn would become the vassal of one still richer. Each knight did homage and swore fidelity to his lord. You're willing to become completely my man? I am willing. I promise in good faith that I will in the future be faithful to you. I will observe my homage to you against all persons, in good faith and without deceit. For his pledge of allegiance, the lord gave his new vassal a thief, consisting of land and labor. The vassal was obliged 
to follow his Lord in war and to give him service, advice when he needed it. The Lord, in turn, was bound to protect and aid his vassal. Thus the knights became arranged in a pyramid. The man at the top, the king, had no lord. The knights at the bottom had no vassals. In between the top man and the bottom man, everyone was both lord and vassal. While the knight could not injure his lord or his lord's family and was limited in his behavior to other vassals with his lord, all other people were fair game. The Lord, in turn, was obliged to treat his vassal according to feudal custom. This custom was set by all the Lord's vassals meeting in his court. I have called you in because I need more military service than you are pledged to give me. More? You are given 40 days a year already. Is that not enough? I shall need another 20 days. Split. 20 days. Would you agree to pay all my expenses? I will agree to that. And you? If you pay the expenses. So that is settled. Done. Done. And so a new feudal custom is established. In general, this is the story of feudalism on the European continent from about 900 on. Feudalism did not spread to England until the year 1066. In this fateful year, William the Norman conquered England after a stunning victory on a ridge near the town of Hastings in southern England. William brought to England more than Norman rule. He brought the feudal system. He gave fiefs to his captains, who in turn gave fiefs to their knights. England became a completely feudal state. It differed from Normandy, however, in one important respect. In Normandy, a man was either a knight or an unfree villain. Anglo-Saxon England had many small free farmers, and William did not change their status. The actual difference between a freeman and a knight was simply a matter of social grade, similar to the difference between a millionaire and a half-millionaire in our society. While the small freeman held his land by different arrangements uh, than the knight, they were equal before the law. Knights and freemen probably formed something like a third of the population. William the Conqueror and his successors wanted to build a strong, centralized government. They wanted to avoid the limits set on their power by feudal custom. They wanted the king's will to replace feudal law. On the other hand, the feudal class, barons and knights, were determined to keep the privileges given them by feudal custom. Around the year 1100, the barons and knights were disturbed by the disregard of King Henry I for feudal custom. King Henry once insisted that a younger son inherit his father's land, merely because he was a better knight than his elder brother, the legal heir. If the elder had been feeble-minded or an obvious weakling, the barons would have approved. But merely because one knight was better than the other, there was no reason to break the law. When King John came along 100 years later, around 1200, he inherited Henry's disdain for law. John, like Henry, was determined to increase his power. He was also desperately in need of money. Towns had been growing larger, the demand for food greater, and consequently agricultural prices higher. Everyone with land was growing rich. But poor John had given all his land as thieves, and his revenue was pretty much fixed by custom. He was caught by inflation. He needed more money, and one way to get it was to make his will stronger than feudal law. This was difficult to do. For one thing, John's coronation oath pledged him to obey the feudal law. I swear that all the days of my life I shall give peace, honor, and reverence to God, the Holy Church, and to all ordained clergy. I swear that I shall execute true justice and equity. I swear that should there be any unjust laws or bad customs in my realm, I shall put an end to them. And I shall favor good laws 
and guard them without fraud. But then, on the other hand, since John was anointed with holy oil, he felt he was appointed by God to rule, uh, and that his will should be supreme. The barons, however, felt that John should obey the law regardless of this divine appointment. Discontent was common among knights of all ages, but particularly under, among those under King John. Other kings had broken feudal customs. Some had gotten away with it. Others had not. Some of the kings broke custom with subtlety. Others made the miss doing right by added generosity in some other matter. King John was not subtle, and he was not light. Some of the barons decided he had broken feudal law once too often. The barons asked help from Stephen Langdon, Archbishop of Canterbury, and one of the great scholar statesmen of the day. We must be able to do something. He took half my land and most of my cattle. And he holds my three sons hostage in his castle at Windsor. His demands are unjust. Uh, gentlemen, gentlemen, please. I was asked here to help you in your dispute with the king, but as yet I have heard nothing but petty squabbling. But he holds my three sons prisoners <clears throat> for a debt which I cannot pay. And he is pressing me to pay the money that I owe to the Jews. Why should he worry about them? He is trying to give one of my baronies to his bastard brother. These are personal grievances. Important they may be, but personal. And to other knights from whom you seek support, these are petty. Not petty. Talking to Stephen Langdon are some of the men who will start the revolt against King John. They are motivated from purely personal reasons. They want lands, castles, and privileges, which John has withheld from them. Stephen Langdon has been asked to help draft their charter. Langdon points out that they will get little support from their fellow barons if their requests are all selfish. He persuades them to work out a program that will appeal to all knights and all freemen. It is a program based on feudal custom, custom that John is ignoring. The document which came out of this meeting of barons we call, appropriately enough, the Articles of the Barons. When King John received the barons' demands, Stephen Langton, the man instrumental in formulating the demands, and William Marshall, a great baron loyal to the king, met with John to discuss the terms of the agreement. Why did the barons not ask for my kingdom also? These demands are wholly unreasonable. I shall never grant such liberties that will render me a slave. Why be so hasty, your highness? You're not in a very strong position to defy these barons. There are strong men among these. And besides, what harm can come from approving these demands? You will have to change your ways but little, for most of these demands, indeed all of them, are already law. They seem to be asking you to reaffirm your faith in our law, Your Majesty. Huh. Well, maybe you're right. Besides, approving their demands now will give me time to get my troops from Poitou. <laughs> <laughs> Wait until my army is assembled. Then we'll see how demanding the barons are. <laughs> John was stalling for time. Militarily, he was in an awkward position. The barons controlled London and several other strategic cities. John did not have his troops assembled and could not defy their demands. Consequently, he met the barons at Runnymede a meadow near his great castle of Windsor. And after hearing the terms of the barons once again, ordered his seal affixed to the document. John's clerks went to work to make the articles of the barons into a formal royal charter, Magna Carta. A copy of Magna Carta was sent to every sheriff in England with instructions that the sheriff was to read it to all knights and freemen. John, by the grace of God, King of England, Lord of Ireland, Duke of Normandy, Aquitaine, and Count of Anjou, to his archbishops, bishops, abbots, earls, barons, 
justiciaries, foresters, sheriffs, governors, officers, and to all bailiffs and his faithful subjects, greeting. Know ye that we in the presence of God and for the salvation of our soul and the souls of all... The reading of the formal document takes more than an hour. There are 62 chapters, each dealing with a different subject. Some chapters of special interest to Knight, some to Freeman, some to no one. Many of the chapters deal with trivial items, but others are of great and lasting importance. The first article guarantees the liberties of the Church of England. The 39th article is of special interest to Freeman. Our ancestors, no Freeman shall be arrested, nor imprisoned, nor deprived of his property, nor outlawed, nor exiled, nor in any way destroyed, nor shall the king attack him or send men to attack him except by the judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. Forty, we will sell to no man nor deny to any man either justice or right. Forty-one, all merchants shall have safe and secure... And of special interest to the barons, is article number 61. No freemen shall be arrested. The barons may choose five and twenty barons of the kingdom whom they think convenient, who shall take care and with all their might to hold and observe and cause to be observed the peace and liberties we have granted them. And by this our present charter confirms. It is all this chapter goes on at considerable length, explaining the power of these barons over the king should he stray from right. They are even given the right to make war against him, should such an extreme measure become necessary. Right. <clears throat> given under our hand, in the presence of the witnesses above named, in the meadow called Runnymede, between Windsor and Staines, the 15th day of June in the 17th year of our reign, 1215. <laughs> Most of the provisions of Magna Carta simply settle disputed points in feudal custom. One clause, however, is of supreme importance. No freeman shall be arrested, nor imprisoned, nor deprived of his property, nor outlawed, nor exiled, nor in any way destroyed. Nor shall the king attack him or send men to attack him except by the judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. Thus every free man was safe in person and property unless condemned by due process of law, trial in a feudal court if he were a knight, or by whatever process the law provided if he were an ordinary freeman. This, in fact, is the origin of due process of law. To King John, however, Magna Carta was simply a means of getting a brief respite to gather an army. He hadn't the slightest intention of observing Magna Carta. The barons knew this, and they made ready for war. John started traveling around the country, ravaging the lands of people he didn't like. He made a raid into Norfolk and Suffolk, territory almost solidly in the hands of the rebellious barons. Then he started north, and crossing the wash, he miscalculated the tide and lost all his baggage in the sea. John got up into Lincolnshire, and having lost his food with his baggage, had to eat whatever was available. Here he died of too many peaches and too much ale. Although he died, Magna Carta survived. It was reissued with some revisions many times in the Middle Ages as a symbol of the king's obligation to obey the law. Thus, individual liberty became a part of the fundamental law applying to all freemen. The guarantee of individual liberty is a great contribution of the Middle Ages. Now today you've seen how the Middle Ages clearly defined the roles of the two factions in government, the states, and the people. Now the government kept its power, but it was a limited power, and their people gained their civil rights and freedom they too were limited. In short, a workable balance was struck. Now when the Magna Carta was issued, it applied only to freemen, about a third of the total English population. But as time went on, the unfree gradually became free 
until all Englishmen were equal before the law. Now the Magna Carta became the first entry in every collection of the laws of England. But as the world changed, freedoms were enlarged. And today we have many freedoms not mentioned in the Magna Carta. But the concept of individual liberties guaranteed by the government has come to us from this document. And as we look back over the history of what's happened from that time until our own, we can see that the Magna Carta was referred to over and over again. During the tyrannical reign of the Stuarts in England, those who wanted to be free of that reign referred to the Magna Carta. They used it as something important. When people in our own country, here in the United States, struck for their freedom during the American Revolution, Thomas Jefferson and others went back to Justice Cook, who had written about the Magna Carta, had gotten ideas from the Magna Carta, more ideas about freedom. And from that time until our own, it has been proven that tyrants who wish to rule the people cannot rule them unless the people so desire. Now our thanks to Dr. Painter for this look at the origins of our liberty. We hope you've enjoyed it and that you'll be with us next week when we tell the fascinating story, a 20th century story, of a mechanical man designed to work in areas of high radiation, but who also can putt a golf ball and play hide and seek as well. Be with us next week for The Hot Stuff Man. properties used on today's program, we wish to thank Evergreen House Foundation and Brass Town. Portions of this program were mechanically reproduced. Hopkins File 7 has been selected for viewing by our armed forces overseas and originates in the studios of Westinghouse Station, WJZ-TV, in Baltimore, Maryland. Enjoy Cat of Paradise tonight on Maverick, followed by Lawman on ABC Television Network.